Astounding Stories of Super Science, May 1930, Section 5, Murder Madness, Chapter 3, by Murray Leinster, read by Tommy Howell. Bell saw what he was looking for, out in the throng of traffic that filled the Avenida do Acre in Rio. He had seen it over the heads of the crowd, which was undersized as most Brazilian crowds are, and he managed to get through the perpetual jam on the mosaic sidewalk and reach the curb. He stood there and regarded the vehicles filling the broad avenue, wearing exactly the indifferent, half-amused air of a tourist with no place in particular to go, and a great deal of time in which to go there. Taxis chuffed past, disputing right-of-way with private cars, which were engaged in more disputes with other cars all in the rather extraordinary bad temper and contentiousness which comes to the Latin American when he takes the wheel of an automobile. As if coming to an unimportant decision, Bell raised his hand to an approaching cab. It had two men on the chauffeur's seat, of course. All taxis in Rio carry two men in front. One drives, and the other lights his cigarettes, makes witty comments upon passing ladies, and helps in collecting the fares from recalcitrant passengers. The extra man is called the secretary. And he assists materially in giving an impression of haughty pride. The taxi ground to the curb. The secretary reached behind him indifferently and opened the door. Bell did not glance at him. He stepped inside and settled down languidly. The Biera Mar, he said listlessly. The taxi started off with a jolt. It is the invariable custom in Rio de Janeiro, and besides, it reminds the passenger that he is merely a customer, admitted to the cab on sufferance, and that he must be suitably meek to those who will presently, blandly ignore the amount registered by the meter and demand a fare of from eight to twenty-seven times the indicated amount. The cab went shooting down the Avenida do Acre toward the harbor. The Avenida do Acre is officially the Avenida Rio Blanco, and it should be called by that name. Only people forget. The Biera Mar, however, is named with entire propriety. It is actually the edge of the sea, and it is probably one of the two or three most beautiful driveways in the world. The cab whirled past the crowded sidewalks. Incredible numbers of people, with an incredible variation in the shades of their complexions, moved to and from with the peculiar aimlessness of a Brazilian crowd. A stout and pompous Negro politician from Bahia, wearing an orchid in his buttonhole, rubbed elbows with a striking blonde lady on the sidewalks on his left, and forced a wizened little silk-headed parla, approximately an octoroon, to dodge about him in order to progress. A young and languid person, his clothes the very last expiring gasp of fashion, fingered his stick patiently. He wore the painstakingly cultivated expression of bored disillusionment your young Brazilian dandy considers aristocratic. It was very probable that he shared a particularly undesirable bedroom with four or five other young men in order to purchase such clothing. But then Farenda Vita, making a picture is the national Brazilian sport. Bell lighted a cigarette. It was not wise to regard the secretary of this particular taxi too closely, but if his face had been thickly smeared with coal dust, and if he had had a two weeks beard, and if he had been seen on the forecastle of the Almarante Gomez, one would have deduced him to be a stoker who had not used the name of Jameson. The cab reached the Biera Mar, and turned to take the long route about the bay. It was one of the most beautiful views to be found anywhere, and tall apartment houses have been built along its whole length to capitalize the scenery. True, the more brightly colored ladies of the capital have established themselves in vast numbers among these apartment houses, but in their languid promenades they add, let us say, the beauties of art to those of nature. A voice spoke from the chauffeur's seat. Bell. Right, said Bell without moving. His eyes flickered, however, and he found the device Jameson had inserted, 
a speaking tube of sorts. Not especially efficient, but inconspicuous enough. He stirred listlessly and got his lips near it. All right to talk, he asked briefly. Shoot, said Jameson from the secretary's seat beside the chauffeur. This man doesn't understand English, and he thinks I'm in a smuggling gang. He expects to make some money out of me eventually. Bell spoke curtly while the taxi rolled past the Moro de Gloria with its quaint old church and went along the winding, really marvelous driveway past many beaches with the incredibly blue water beyond. Canaleus is out of town, he said. It isn't known when he'll be back. I met his daughter at a dance at our embassy here, and she told me. We didn't dare talk much, but she's frightened, especially after what happened to Ortiz. And I've met Ribiera, whom Ortiz named. I've been looking him up, growled Jameson through the speaking tube. Bell flicked the ash from his cigarette out the door and went on quietly. He's trying to get friendly with me. I've promised to call at his house and have him take me out to the flying field. He has two planes, he tells me, a big amphibian and a two-seater. uses them for commuting between Rio and his place back inland. He went out of his way to cultivate me. I think he suspects I'm trying to find out something. Which you are, said Jameson dryly. You found out that Ortiz was right at least about... Bell nodded, and frowned at himself for having nodded. He spoke into the mouthpiece by his head with an expressionless face. He's practically fawned upon by a bunch of important officials and several high-ranking army officers. Suspecting what I do, I think he's got hold of a devil of a lot of power. Jameson scowled in a lordly fashion upon a mere pedestrian who threatened to impede the movement of the taxicab by making it run over him. Ortiz, said Bell quietly, told me he'd been poisoned. And treason asked as the price of the antidote. I've heard that the Brazilian Minister for Foreign Affairs went insane six months ago. I heard also that it was homicidal mania, murder madness. And I'm wondering if these people who fawn upon Ribiera aren't paying a price for, well, antidotes or their equivalent. The Minister for Foreign Affairs may have refused. You're improving, said Jameson dryly. The taxi rounded a curve in a vista of sea and sand and royal palms spread out before it. Yes, you're improving. But Ortiz spoke of Ribiera only as a deputy of the Master. Who is the Master? God knows, said Bell. He stared languidly out of the window for all the world to see. A tourist, regarding the boasted beauties of the Biera Mar. A deputy, said Jameson without emotion of some unknown person called the Master poisoned Ortiz in Buenos Aires, and Ortiz was an important man in the Argentine. Ribiera is merely the deputy of that same unknown master in Rio, and he has generals and state presidents and the big politicians paying court to him. If deputies in two countries that we know of have so much power, how much power has the Master? Silence. The taxi chugged steadily past unnoticed beauties and colorings. Rio was really one of the most beautiful cities in the world. It's like this, said Jameson jerkily. Seven servicemen vanish and one goes mad. You get two tips that the fate of Ortiz is the fate of the seven men. Eight, in fact. We find that two men dispense a certain ghastly poison in two certain cities at the orders of a man they call the Master. We find that those two men wield an astounding lot of power. And we know they're only deputies, only subordinates of the Master. We know also that the servicemen vanished all over the whole continent, not just in those two cities. How many deputies has the master? What's it all about? He wanted treason of Ortiz, we know. What does he want of the other men his deputies have enslaved? Why did he poison the servicemen? And why, especially why, do two honorable men, officials of two important nations, want to tip off the United States government about the ghastly business? What's it got to do with our nation? Bell flung away his cigarette. That last question has occurred to me, too, he observed, and carefully repressed a slight shiver. I have made a guess, which is probably insane. I'm going to see Ribiera this afternoon. 
He already suspects you know too much, said Jameson without expression. I am, Bell managed the ghost of a mirthless smile. I am uncomfortably aware of it, and I may need an antidote as badly as Ortiz. If I do and can't help myself, I'll depend on you. Jameson growled. I simply mean, said Bell very quietly, that I'd really rather not be, er, left alive if I'm mad. That's all. But Ortiz knew what was the matter with him before he got bad off. I know it's a risk. I'm goose flesh all over. But it, somebody's got to take the risk. The guess I've made may be insane, but if it's right, one or two lives will be cheap enough as a price for the information. Suppose you chaps turn around and take me to Ribiera's house. There was a long pause, then Jameson spoke in Portuguese to his companion. The taxi checked, swerved, and began to retrace its route. You're a junior in the trade, said Jameson painstakingly. I can't order you to do it. Bell fumbled with his cigarette case. The trade doesn't exist, Jameson, he said dryly. And besides, nobody gives orders in the trade. There are only suggestions. Now shut up a while. I want to try to remember some consular reports I read once from the consul of Puerto Pachecho. What? The consul there, said Bell, smiling faintly, was an amateur botanist. He filled up his consular reports with accounts of native Indian medicinal plants and drugs, with copious notes and clinical observations. I had to reprove him severely for taking up space with such matters and not going fully into the exact number of hides, wet and dry, that passed through the markets in his district. His information will be entirely useless in this present emergency, but I'm going to try to remember as much of it as I can. Now shut up. When the taxi swung off the Biera Mar to thread its way through many tree-lined streets, it is a misdemeanor punishable by fine to cut down a tree in Rio de Janeiro. It carried a young American with the air of an accomplished idler, who has been mildly bored by the incomparable view from the waterside boulevard. When it stopped at the foot of one of the slum-covered moros that dot all Rio, and a liveried doorman came out of a splendid residence to ask the visitor his name. The taxi discharged a young American who seemed to feel the heat. In spite of the swift motion of the cab, he wiped off his forehead with his handkerchief as he was assured that the Señor Ribiera had given orders that he was to be admitted night or day. When the taxi drove off, it carried two men on the chauffeur's seat, of whom one had lost, temporarily, the manner of haughty insolence, which is normally inseparable from the secretary of a taxicab chauffeur. But though he wiped his forehead with his handkerchief, Bell actually felt rather cold when he followed his guide through ornately furnished rooms which seemed innumerable, and was at last left to wait in an especially luxurious salon. There was a pause, a rather long wait, a distinctly long wait. Bell lighted a cigarette and seemed to become mildly bored. He regarded a voluptuous small statuette with every appearance of pleased interest. A subtly decadent painting seemed to amuse him considerably. He did not seem to notice that no windows at all were visible, and that shaded lamps lit this room, even in broad daylight. Two servants came in, a footman in livery and the majordomo. Your average carioca servant is either fawning or covertly insolent. These two were obsequious. The footman carried a tray with a bottle, glass, ice, and siphon. The Señor Ribiera, announced the majordomo obsequiously, begs that the Señor Bell will oblige him by waiting for the shortest of moments until the Señor Ribiera can relieve himself of a business matter. It will be but the shortest of moments. Bell felt a little instinctive chill at the sight of the bottle and glasses. Oh, very well, he said idly. You may put the tray there. The footman lifted the siphon expectantly. Bell regarded it indifferently. The wait before the arrival of this drink had been longer than would be required merely for the announcing of a caller and the tending of a tray, especially if such a tray were a custom of the place, and the sending of a single bottle only without inquiry into his preferences. No soda, said Bell. He poured out a drink into the tinier glass. He lifted it toward his lips, hesitated vaguely, and 
drew out his handkerchief again. He sneezed explosively, and the drink spilled. He swore irritably and put down the glass and plied his handkerchief vigorously. A moment later he was standing up and pouring the drink out afresh from the bottle in one hand to the glass in the other. He uptilted the glass. Get rid of this for me, he said annoyedly of the handkerchief. He saw a nearly imperceptible glance pass between the footman and the majordomo. They retired, and Bell moved about the room exactly like a young man who had been discomfited by the necessity of sneezing before servants. Anywhere else in the world, of course, such a pose would not have been convincing. But your Brazilian not only adopts Facenda Fita as his own avocation, but also suspects it to be everybody else's, too. And a young Brazilian of the leisure class would be horribly annoyed at being forced to so plebeian an exhibition in public. He moved restlessly about the room, staring at the picture. Presently he blinked uncertainly, and gazed about less definitely. He went rather uncertainly to the chair he had first occupied, and sat down. He poured, or, or seemed to pour, another drink. Again he sneered and looked mortified. He put down the glass with an air of finality. But he looked puzzledly about him. Then he sank back in his chair, and gradually seemed to sink into a sort of apathetic indifference. He looked, then, like a very bored young man on the verge of dozing off. But actually he was very much alert indeed. He had the feeling of eyes upon him for a while. Then that sensation ceased and he settled himself to wait. And meantime he felt a particular, peculiar gratitude to the late American consul at Puerto Pachecho for his interest in medicinal plants. That gentleman had gone into the subject with the passionate enthusiasm of the amateur. He had described Icus, Urari, and Timbo. He had particularized upon Macaca Nimbi and Ervamura, and he had gone into a wealth of detail concerning Yachacque on account of its probable value if used in criminology. As consul at Puerto Pachecho, he was not altogether a success in some ways, but he had invented an entirely original method of experimentation upon those drugs and poisons which did not require to be introduced into the bloodstream. His method was simplicity itself. An alcoholic solution carried a minute quantity of the drug in its vapor, just as an alcoholic solution carries a minute quantity of perfuming essential oil. He inhaled the odor of the alcoholic solution. The effect was immediately, strictly temporary, and not dangerous. He was unable to describe the odors, in some cases the tastes, and in a few instances the effects of the substances he listed from personal experience. And Bell had used his method as an unpromising but possible test for a drug in the drink that had been brought him. He inhaled the strangling odor of the spilled liquor on his handkerchief. And there was a drug involved. For an instant he was dizzy, and for an instant he saw the room through a vivid blue haze. And something clicked in his brain and said, It's Yahweh. And the relief of dealing with something which he knew, if only at second hand, was so enormous that he felt almost weak. Yahweh you see, is an extract from the leaves of a plant which is not yet included in Materia Medica. It has nearly the effect of scopolamine, once famous in connection with twilight sleep, and produces a daze of blue light, an intolerable sleepiness, and practically all the effects of hypnotism. A person under Yahque, as under scopolamine or hypnosis, will seem to slumber and yet will obey any order by whomever given. He will answer any question without reserve or any concealment, and on awakening he will remember nothing done under the influence of the potion. The effects are not particularly harmful. Bell then sat in an apparent half-dazed, half-slumber, in the salon in which he waited for Ribiera to appear. He knew exactly what he was expected to do. Ribiera wanted to find out what he knew or suspected about Ortiz's death. Ribiera wanted to know many things, and he would believe what Bell told him because he thought Bell had taken enough Yahweh to be practically 
an hypnotic subject. Let Ribiera believe what he was told. When he came into the room, bland and smiling, Bell did not stir. He was literally crawling inside with an unspeakable repulsion to the man and the things for which he stood. And he seemed dazed and dull, and when Ribiera began to ask questions, he babbled his answers in a toneless, flat voice. He babbled very satisfactorily, in Ribiera's view. When Ribiera shook him roughly by the shoulder, he started and let his eyes clear. Ribiera was laughing heartily. Senor, senor, said Ribiera jovially. My hospitality is at fault. You come to be my guest, and I allow you to be so bored that you drop off to sleep. I was detained for five minutes and came in to find you slumbering. Bell stared ruefully about him and rubbed his eyes. Ah, oh, I did for a fact, he admitted apologetically. I'm sorry, up late last night and I was tired. I dropped in to see those planes you suggested I'd be interested in. But I dare say it's late now. Ribiera chuckled again. He was in his late and corpulent forties and was something of a dandy. If one were captious, one might object to the thickness of his lips. They suggested sensuality, and there was a shade, a bare shade, more of pigment in his skin than the American passes altogether unquestioned. And his hair was wavy, but he could be a charming host. We'll have a drink, he said bluntly, while the car's coming around to the door and then go out to the flying field. Oh, no drink, said Bell, lifting his hand. I feel squeamish now, I say. Haven't you changed the lamps or something? Everything looks blue. That was a lie. This was a lie. Things looked entirely normal to Bell, and he looked about him as if vaguely puzzled. If he had drunk the liquor Ribiera had sent him, things would have had a bluish tinge for some time after, but as it was... Ribiera chaffed him jovially on the way to the flying field, and introduced him to flyers and officials of the field, he told with gusto of Bell's falling asleep while waiting for him. A very jolly companion, Ribiera. But Bell saw two or three men looking at him very queerly, almost sympathetically. And he noticed a little later that a surprising number of flyers and officials of the airport seemed to be concealing an abject terror of Ribiera. One or two of them seemed to hate him as well. End of Section 5, Murder Madness Chapter 3, 